our Thursday conversation on social issues. I'm Anita, one of the new reference assistants. Today we have Nicole Harris from Western Washington University and one of our own students, Alejandro Julio, here to talk to you about homelessness, mentoring, and community-based education. Our library promotes the freedom of information and the open exchange of ideas, and we believe that this series is an extension of that. While you might not agree with everything you see in the collection or the ideas that you hear today from the attendees or the speakers, we ask that you please be respectful and listen and try and learn from each other. Um, just to let you know, you are being videotaped. If anyone has a problem with that, come and talk to me. And we love having students give these presentations. So if you have an idea that you're passionate about and you want to give a talk, come and talk to me or Kelly McHenry, our librarian, and her email is on the board. Okay, so enjoy. As she said, my name is Nicole Harris. I am a graduate student at Western Washington University, and I'm studying rehabilitation counseling. I'm also a certified K-8 instructor here in the state of Washington. Um, currently, I am the coordinating assistant for the Western Washington University Lehigh, or Low Income Housing Institute um, program. So the Woodring College of Education at Western Washington University and the Department of Adult and Higher Ed Partner with the Lehigh program here in Seattle. Today I'm here along with a member of our program to briefly share what we've done and discovered over the last 10 months. While I'm talking, you should notice there are handouts that are circulating and there's also a sign-in sheet if you're interested in volunteering with our program. So feel free to fill those out. First, I'd like to give you a brief description of the program, and then I'll show you a short video that details why students volunteer for our program and why it's important for our membership. The Lehigh program with Western is a year-long community-based mentoring project designed to empower residents and to develop their job skills, their computer literacy skills, and other soft skills so that they will facilitate stable employment and housing. A group of diverse and highly qualified students from Seattle Community Colleges applied and were selected for a 12-week blended learning training. These students were also selected as mentors. The core foundations of the training were the growth of the student mentors, the Lehigh residents, and our program. Furthermore, we wanted to develop a learning committee that held high expectations of interaction, reflection, and one where students and mentors and residents all felt supported. The student mentors learned community-based participatory action research methods, tutoring and mentoring pedagogy, and barriers that the Lehigh residents face, causes of being at risk and homeless, and key techniques for serving the Lehigh residents. Applying what they learned in their training, the student mentors provided one-on-one -on -one tutoring to the residents living in the Lehigh program. The goal of the tutoring was to create a partnership between the student mentors and the residents. The student mentors and residents work on developing skills to increase the residents' Um, sense of community and their self-sufficiency in the form of community-based participatory action research the groups collaboratively um, exchanged ideas between the residents and the mentors and they were able to diagnose barriers in the residents lives pose solutions and act on those solutions the solutions of course were based on how the residents saw them to be fit, and um, they were defined by the cultural norms and expectations of the residents. So rather than having the uh, student mentors impose solutions, the, the residents came up with the solutions. So I want to shift gears a little bit and show you a video that our marketing intern created at Western. The video is called the Lehigh WW Mentoring Project, Why I Want to Be a Mentor. And the purpose of showing this video is so hopefully you can see how valuable um, the program is and 
recognize why we want you to join our program. I first came to the city and I was, you know, had, you know, I was living a paycheck or two away from homelessness and I was like scared to go home to where I was renting sometimes and, you know, I was feeling insecure to myself but like I never had anybody there to do that and so it was really like a lot to me to be able to be that person that I never had. Nice was totally different in the way people talk and they talk way faster than what I can do. <laughs> oh, yeah. It is cool when we can and um, so I think of like for all the immigrants like they have a whole family and not like all of them normal English so put myself in those people's clothes. I don't really know like what I'm not pretty sure like what can I do and how would I deal with the life here with like not knowing the language and not knowing anybody? So I feel like they kind of gave me a lot of very good resources and I want to speak. And then this is my first quarter with American students and it's hard to see what is the real face. And I, I hear, I've heard a lot of like stories people that have been homeless. I have a friend who and her ex-husband tried to kill her. And I think that it's important to me as a, as a human service provider to be involved in the, in the real thing. And that's why I'm here and I'm so excited. Uh, I used to be in a program where I was mentored and it was one of the best experiences I've ever had. And I learned that not only did I learn stuff, but my mentor, she learned stuff. So it's like, it's beneficial both ways. And since then, I decided that I wanted to be more part of the community to see how I can help others and also learn this stuff. Well, this image where I think, I think things like institutionalized racism cause a lot of poverty and they're perpetual. And I think that they're, they're going to be around for a while. And the best way to counteract that is to educate, educate those groups to survive in the system that's there. And that's something that I work for both my parents who, as Mexican immigrants, I was able to later in life both go to both of my parents' citizenship ceremonies through the fact that I was able to provide for them. And so I'm here to, to provide a service and not to provide help, because I think that's a very a clear distinction we need to make. So we need to service these people versus help. Mentoring was the best way to promote your own uh, sense of what you want because you're not judge it's not about judging, it's about asking what can you what would you like to do? What do you want? Where do you want to go? How do you want to do it? Do you know how to do it? Would you like to ask some questions to see if I know how to help you do it or something like that? Mentoring seems to be more it's a friendlier way than teaching where it's kind of teaching, but it's friendlier on a certain kind of level. It's like a big brother or big sister. So more equal. Yeah, yeah, which is real important. I thought it was interesting that one of the last speakers, maybe he was the last speaker, made a distinction between service and help. And I was wondering, did that reflect sort of Lehigh's approach in general? And if so, if you would talk more about it. So, um, 
I can speak on behalf of Western and because I was facilitating the online discussions and the trainings and that's how we approached the training is we're here to service people we're not going to rescue people because that's not our job we're serving people we're helping them in their process we don't empower others they empower themselves did that answer your question yeah, thank you there is another I wanted to just comment on the um, idea that in mentoring that relationship, the, it's each person, each side is learning from the other. And I, I like that. Because it's more of an exchange. And everybody benefits. So just wanted to say that's a positive. Thank you. I want to honor that. Because it, that is so true. Because um, even as an educator, I feel like I get so much more out of what other people are doing and learn so it's kind of in some respects the educator or the mentor learns even more sometimes. How did the people who were, who were mentored here see, see the program? So um, I will let Alejandro speak to that when we get to that portion. That's a great question. So if you get all of your questions we'll get to that. collaboration with the mentors, the residents made connections with other institutions and organizations. Ultimately, they built their social capital. With an increased sense of empowerment, the residents accessed more resources and became more digitally engaged. The residents experienced advances in their soft skills as well. While building a rapport, the student mentors and residents engaged in new modes of communication and expanded their opportunities within their community. This resulted in developing more social relationships, which we found, um, so the staff on our end, we're doing a program evaluation right now. What we're finding is um, the <coughs> connections are crucial to helping um, the residents um, establish employment or um, secure housing. So that's, that's been one of our findings. Um, as a staff, my fellow colleagues and I witnessed that just as the residents experienced growth, as many of you pointed out, so did our mentors. The mentors engaged in opportunities to change their perspectives and challenge their thinking around social barriers and housing instability. To understand what the meaning of at risk or homeless was, the res or excuse me, the mentors engaged in um, activities online that helped them understand how nuanced what it means to be social, um, excuse me, um, to be housing insecure and to be homeless. What that means. Also, they understood their the culture of poverty by critiquing it in their online sessions. They also witnessed how empowering it is to hear someone's story. Resident stories dissolve many of the students' previously held misconceptions, stereotypes, and stigmas. In their advocacy work, the student mentors expressed high levels of empathy and became increasingly more engaged to the responses of the heightened awareness of many of the variables contributing to housing insecurity. Furthermore, the student mentors experienced true partnerships with the residents with whom they worked. Today, you're going to hear from Alejandra, and she's going to share with you what she gleaned from the program and her experiences working with the residents. So I'd like to introduce you. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm on the social and human services field. This is my third quarter now, and the video of my first quarter was winter. And I decided to join this program because I've always been like, I always care about people. I always like to help, to say, if, if that's the right word to say. And I started joining, I, I joined the project in January this year, and I went to, to this process with two residents of the Lehigh program. The first one, uh, we only get to have, we only had three sessions with her. She was recently homeless and she just got her, her apartment like three months before we started the program. So she wasn't really adapt to to the life being like in her own house, her own place. And at some point she told me that 
she wasn't sure that she wanted to continue with this because she didn't know if she was going to have eventually the resources to do whatever she was dreaming to. She wanted to learn how to use a computer, basic things as, as like how to turn off, like turn a computer, use a keyboard, things that we take as granted for us. But for her, it was her first time doing that. And so she quit it, she quit to the, to the program and I got another resident and he lived in downtown Seattle and with him we were more successful. <laughs> we had more, more success. Uh, we became really, really close. We talk about life, about what led him to being homeless because a lot of people have this misconception that homelessness it's just because people uh, was, uh, had like drug, uh, substance abuse problems or they just, they're just like lazy to work. But no, there's a lot, a lot of different things that takes people to be a homeless situation. So in his case, he had substance abuse disorders and unfortunately he lost everything. He was a singer, he, owned his, he used to own his own company. All that's gone for now. And what, what we, we work mostly on getting job opportunities for him, volunteering opportunities. And he got maybe five or six events where he volunteered with youth in the YMCA. Um, and it's been, it's been amazing. It's been amazing. And I was wondering, like, have any of you guys have been working as volunteers any time, like some time? What have done volunteering? Um, I've taught English. I've, I've also worked as a social worker. I've been a case manager. I've done quite a few things. What about you? Would you like to share with us? Oh, oh. Uh, I volunteered with uh, Books of Prisoners. Uh, uh, which I think is a very successful program that the prisoners who receive books uh, like that, you know, they're, they're very pleased with. Uh, also, it, it, I volunteered with a couple of arts organizations. Um, and I, I can't think of every other thing that I've done so far, but I have worked with uh, non-profit social service agencies. Thank you. So what did it do to be a volunteer? Uh, well, I wanted to just engage in um, kind of sustaining my own kind of individual like communities. So for me, I volunteer through the Lifelong AIDS Alliance, and I assist with the health, education, youth outreach program. And for me, I'm just advocating um, kind of sexual health to the youth. And over the last weekend, I volunteered with the youth program at the Gay Straight Alliance uh, Leadership Summit. And it was a summit for high school students, and for me, I just, I just want to mentor students in general who are younger than I am, so that they themselves can feel empowered to mentor and within their own communities. And so, you were asking a question. Can you repeat that? No. So, yeah, I I will encourage you guys to join the Lehigh program. Is going to be extremely good for you, and it's going to help you to create relationships with homeless people. It's going to help you to become more sensitive to the situations that they're dealing with. And do you have I know, any questions that I can answer? How do the people? Sorry, you want to ask yours? One? Okay. How do the people who participate in the program, not the mentors, but the people who are mentored, how do they find the program? Okay, so I found out the program last quarter in my sociology class. My teacher said that what's so much to you was recruiting people to be a volunteer, so. But the people who are receiving the services, oh, okay. how do they? So uh, I think they also got information I, I'm not sure how to get. I can but, speak to, okay. I'll give you a good example. So um, one of the mentors who was working with the residents, um, she saw that the residents' passion was in helping in her community and volunteering. And so they worked collaboratively to make a um, 
community-based participatory action research project based on volunteering. So that resident actually became a mentor in Lehigh. So she is now mentoring other people from the program. So in some situations, former residents become mentors. Does that answer the question? Oh, yeah. I don't know. I was in the bathroom. I don't know if you mentioned, but like, how do do we can help the, the residents? Like, it's any kind of skill that we have, or specific skills. So they <coughs> they have they have like a lot of different services that you, that you can provide to them. Okay. Some of them they just want like you know like learn how to use a computer. Okay. Or like you can help them how to search for a job online. So they, like you they have to interview with the, with the resident first, and then he or she will tell you. If I don't you know what the person want to do it, if, sorry, and if I don't know, if the person say I want to do this, but I don't know, how can you do that? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if he asks for something that you don't, yes, uh, you can ask for help. Okay. You know, Lehi has a lot of case managers, people that can ask, they can enlighten you okay. on how to do things. So what does the mentor do that the case manager wouldn't? We work on the one-to-one. -one. The case managers have more than one case. It's also structured tutoring based on digital literacy, um, job development, and vocational training. So case manager would be looking at a fuller picture, like maybe they need health resources and all. So they're managing this person's, not managing, but helping the person manage their life, whereas this is a one-on-one. A, -on -one program. It, exactly. a case manager would be more of like a navigator. Yeah. I, I want to go back to your question. So speak to me more about what, what your question was. So we can I think, I think um, in reviewing the worksheet and thinking about what you said, I answered it. But I was thinking about how some of the people in the room might not be aware of what we mean when we say um, do something about homelessness and poverty or mentor the homeless, you know? So if we think about what our general act interactions are with people who appear to be homeless, right? When we talk about Lehigh, we're talking about a population of people who is already there, yes? These are people who, who this is a residential program? Yes, so some residents may live there, some may live in Nicholsville, some may not. So Got it. And some people may just be at risk, Mm -hmm. I don't, no, I shouldn't say just at risk. Um, they are at risk and they need, um, they request mentoring. But see, those, these are people who opted into this program already. Is that right? Not in every instance. It's, it's going back to the case management situation. Some people um, worked with their case manager and that's how they got tied in. So is this at every uh, unemployment office and DSHS and every agency around this, this paper that people know that there's this available? Great question. Um, it is not at every DSHS, and thank you for that recommendation. Um, we have sent it to all the universities and the community colleges in the area. Um, I will definitely get on that, so thank you for that recommendation. There's a lot. Of there's a lot of places you can put this in. We have public libraries. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a volunteer program? Yes. Yeah. Right, so there's a lot of, every library, every hospital, every agency. Well, the work source office. Well, the work source office, particularly. That's combined services. Workforce. Yeah. Uh, is this any relationship to the, I don't know what the name is, PIASB or whatever that is for the uh, does anybody know what I'm talking about? The people help it. It's a new uh, program that's helping understand why there's homelessness, and what brought on poverty and homelessness in the country, and how can you think about it without getting yourself that out of your head blow up. And uh, <clears throat> I didn't bring it with me. So it's P I A S B dot com or something. Uh, it's something, it's kind of like, I'll have to find it and I can bring it in. If you have a website or something like that, I can email it. Okay, great. I'll email it. 
they <clears throat> we had a, a Canvas website where we had like videos, articles to read, and we basically had like forums. It's not like we had like a class, you know, like this is how you mentor someone. No, it was basically <clears throat> with activities and and trying to develop like more critical thinking about homelessness. They have to learn similar things. We are well. We have to do like eventually we'll do our internship, but we have to take a bunch of classes before that. Joanne is on my program too. Oh, on the SHS program. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so on the SHS program, uh, I'm, I'm currently taking social and human services with certificate in chemical dependency. So. Basically, well, they offer trainings and all that, but we are not, I haven't heard of any volunteer opportunities yet, unfortunately. So, you did this 12 week training. Were you enrolled here while you did it? Yeah. Okay, so students would be able to. Yes. Oh, yes, yeah, it's, it's very flexible. You know, like, at the beginning we had a little problem with the, with the, date, with the due date, so. We had a discussion and then we were like, okay, so at the end of the 12 weeks, everything had to be completed. Yeah, it was, I was able to do it all the time, it was pretty easy. But in my case, I was late with some assignments because I was waiting to be rematched with another resident. So I was like that for three weeks. It, it worked. So, so why are you doing this training? You also have to start to leave? Okay. It goes together, yeah. And when we designed the training, we tried to make it so we knew that not everyone would be matched at the same time. So we tried to build in activities and things that the mentors could do in advance and at different stages. We tried to differentiate it so it wasn't like everyone's at the same point doing the same thing. So um, we tried to make it really flexible and there were a lot of mentors that finished early and there were some that didn't finish at, according to the deadline, we wanted to make it appropriate for each of the mentors to model that for them so they're doing the same thing with the residents. I was wondering how many mentors you have and if um, mentors end up forming a community as mentors, like if they have interaction with each other. Uh, I, can yeah, I don't know how, how many mentors. Are they 10? There are 12. Twelve, like twelve mentors, mm -hmm. but we only met that day, the, the, the first day of the training, and then we interact online. I've seen some of them around school, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. There were a couple that um, would meet up and they worked on the projects together, but that was on their own. And um, it's my impression that that's going to be built into the next round more so, just to build more collaboration time. <coughs> the match with the resident, you interview with him or her, and then you decide what time is better for the both. Like in my case, like it was for me, I don't have classes on Friday, so I had Fridays, like 11 to 12. It's one week per week, I'm sorry, one hour per week. somebody but you're not feeling comfortable doing that with that person. Can you change or how does that work when you get to know the part like a way to resolve the problem or is that problem? You can talk to the person that that might have been the program and they can get you and the resident. So and it's designed to help you and the resident so we want it to work and um, there's also the case manager involved, so there's a lot of supports built into the program. Okay. So. I don't know. So when you were finished, or how does it end with the? Oh, it's with a graduation ceremony. For the for the 
president. Uh -huh. It's like it's symbolic, you know. We give them like that. It's paper writing. He finished the twelve points of training. Uh, how many uh, residents have you mentored and been successful? So, um, I guess, depending on how you want to say successful, because that, that's open for interpretation. Um, personally, this is my first year with the program, so these 12 students and the residents were the group that I've worked with. Uh, last year there was a group as well. I, I honestly don't know off the top of my head how many students and um, residents there were last year. So, but I personally think that anytime there's a connection made and um, even an ounce of the resident's goal is accomplished, I would consider that success. Is there a mechanism to learn from the residents upon graduation how they feel? Like, is there a formal mechanism for, I don't want to say evaluation, but this is what I got down to right. we have, This is we, what I wish I could have gotten. <laughs> we have two interviews. One at the beginning, like before they start the tutoring, and the mentoring, and then at the end of the program, we have another interview. Mm -hmm. And we talk about, like, how do you feel? Do you feel this being successful? How are you? What's the bottom age of a mentee that you accept? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I cannot answer that for Lehigh. I can speak on behalf of Western's program, and it, we have worked with many college students. So my guess is they would need to be 18. So we're talking about, I, I, I came a little bit late, so we're talking about higher ed. But I know um, Lehigh has volunteers that are not community college students. Oh, I didn't mean volunteer. I meant the person who gets mentored. Okay. Um, that would be the youngest person who can participate in the program. That is my impression. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the answer. 18? Is the youngest person you can mentor? I believe, yes. Because that's it. The program we've been working with is designed for adults. Now, I don't know if Lehigh has other programs for you. They might. But what, what's the language that's used to describe, I would say, low income housing? What, how does Lehigh go about, or what is the politically correct term in order to distinguish between the two groups? Just I've always found that within any kind of social structure, it's terribly important to have very clear designations, I would say, for how to refer to different groups. Otherwise, there's a tendency to Lines get very blurred. So you're saying, how would someone refer to a resident? Is that, is that what your question is asking? I, I think we've been referring to them as residents. That, that's the term we're using. Job. 
Once you are over the age of 18, um, they kind of expect you to be on your own. There isn't one right or wrong answer, so. It's a hard one to answer, in part because of the idea of culture. It's hard to get a handle on narrowing that down. But his answer is amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking of culture in a broad sense, so not just mm -hmm. ethnic cultures or mm -hmm. countries. And, um, and so the, the culture, if you want to call it a culture, of foster care. Um, mm -hmm. Foster care stops paying foster parents. The state stops paying them for the people they have in foster care. Uh, once that person turns 18, and there is a high percentage of uh, former foster care children on the streets. Yeah, they run away. But I had a class last quarter, and my teacher said that adolescents that are, are in the streets right now, they, they know services. They know where to go. Mm -hmm. You know, like they're not like completely like naive about that. No, they. They know where to get shelter, where to get food, where to get medical assistance. There's this uh, program called Peace for the Streets from kids, from kids for the Streets. So that's a program for teenagers that are homeless and they, that are pet friendly. So that's why they mostly go to that clinic. Because most of the clinics in Seattle, they're not pet friendly. And you know that most of the teenagers, they have animals with them. So they're like, no, if I have to take my dog out, I'm not going to go. So I think that it will be amazing if more programs of that kind open doors here in Seattle. That was started by a former student. Oh, really? Here. Yeah. Oh. Oh. I guess you could look at it from the other perspective, too, and just say that, you know, the intersection of culture and, and food and, and housing insecurity, if we look at it from not the perspective of the people who are housing insecure, but the people who are not housing insecure. So like a lack of involvement from the people who aren't 
part of that population, you know? So it's, it's a non-intersection, I guess. <laughs> Does that make sense? I was just thinking about a student I had the first quarter I was here, and he had uh, he'd been homeless for 18 years, and he moved to Seattle, and um, it took him a few years to respond to the repeated attempts at outreach by other people. But the fact is that most people just weren't reaching out. Yeah. And, and eventually he found himself um, in transitional housing and going to community college and finding some measure of mainstream success. I'm glad you mentioned that because that's like at the heart of what we're doing is we're trying to find solutions that work for the residents based on what they, mm -hmm. what they want, not prescribing something. It's not going to be sustainable if it's not what they perceive as important to them. Mm -hmm. And if there's no buy in, so thank you for addressing that. So, how do you currently, or how would you, break the myths and misconceptions about homelessness? What are you already doing? Well, one of the things that the uh, religious organization I belong to um, sadly has has hosted Kent City about four or five times. I say sadly because it's been over a number of years, and it's a shame that there's still the need for Kent City. Um, and one of the things um, that we've done is um, we've volunteered in a number of ways um, with the residents of Kent City, but I'm bringing them things and that kind of But they've um, also offered shared meals. And so sitting down and breaking bread with somebody and talking with them is, is one way to, it, it's an equalizing kind of thing and it's a way to get to know somebody and who they are. Going back and hearing that person's story and getting to know them. How else? the idea of what you were talking about, breaking bread and that sort of thing, but what it, what it sadly doesn't address is the people who are wealthy enough to break a lot of bread are not even involved or gentrifying or don't really want us around if we're poor. I wonder if it would be possible to sort of instigate or plant seeds in education in elementary schools to find out, you know, getting teachers involved in that the civil liberty kind of thing and so, uh, for them to, uh, you know, have projects where they can say, okay, today we're going to be homeless and to see what that's like and have kids that, you know, or there's anybody homeless like that. So that's taking some of the um, stigma off of it as opposed to, uh, however anybody gets homeless is always, always looked on as tragic, which it sort of rightly deserves to be. However, 
there, that's not the punishment of the person who is homeless. They still want to live, they still want to breathe, they still want to eat, they still want to have family, they still want to be educated, all of those things. So I wonder if education might be addressed more vehemently uh, with teachers. I have friends who are teachers who are you know, pro-union, pro-teaching kids about what is, what's wrong with the system. And if there were more, I think, possibilities, particularly in elementary, then you can plant the seed early enough to get that started and perhaps maybe break a little bread sooner, hopefully, I wish. But, uh, the feudalism and the vassal and that serfdom concept is very old, and very hard to break, but it's you know one step forward, two steps back. I like your idea of starting early and working with kids. You know, my only concern is if it's a one snapshot kind of deal and we pretend what it's like, it's not. It doesn't really. Well, I didn't. That I just blew that out of my head. Right. So. Could be plenty of other ideas, I'm sure, if a bunch of smart advanced teachers got together to talk about it. Oh, no, it's starting the, the idea that the discussion is great. And I think starting it with kids is really important. Because going back to what was said over here, that's how we break stigma. Stereotypes mm -hmm. is getting yeah. that discussion and forcing it with kids and getting their opinions. With field trips, possibly, you know, going to some place, to Tech City, right? Yeah. That was actually um, the topic of one of our discussions that we had was on, there's a gentleman that's holding tours, homeless tours, and the mentors dialogued about, is this fair? Is this monopolizing people? Is this taking advantage of them? Is this <coughs> making them look a certain way? Is it are we exploring them yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, the third thing is this guy in Seattle, he charges between a thousand and two thousand dollars for making you homeless for today. So he gives you this all the outfit, he takes the shelter, he takes the food bank, because he wants you to live the experience. That's basically it. That's what wow. he wants to do. Where's the money go? Oh, where's the money go? To the oh, no, he's no, 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 no. He said, like, I will donate 25% of the profits.